This is Off Planet Radio. Be those predictors. The first people by Seamus Wiles. They made the ultimate discovery, a mechanism containing both the power to create and to destroy. This machine is dangerous. When we put the word out that we were looking for copies of the book, we found out we weren't the only ones. Who? William Bell. Welcome to Off Planet Radio. This is Eye of the Needle, special interview. We're going to explore spiral time. And my guest today, he comes to us from Eugene, Oregon, where he resides, Nahu Lanham. Professional intuitive counselor for over 40 years, and he teaches growth and awareness of self, ability to control not only the future, but the rate of acceleration, which also grows. He's a poetry writer, author of children's books, science-based studies of ESP and forecasting, as well as operating in paranormal romance and eroticism. When not writing or doing intuitive counseling, he teaches classes on psychic self-development and intellectually explores cutting-edge scientific ideas. His vision is that everyone working together without thought of our differences, national boundaries, philosophies, or racial identities and uniting as one world, one people, one love, one heart. He is the author of over 15 books, which includes titles such as The Tao Spirit Gardening, Ubiquitous Order Forming Algorithm in a Simulated Universe, Cloud Readings, Book with Cards, Ancient Art and Practice of Cloud Divination, UFOs, God God from Inner Space, Spirit, Mind, and Matter, and the UFO Connection, And the book that we're going to talk about during the course of this interview, Spiral Forecasting, Nature's Trick, Inside Track to Future Success. We welcome to the show, Nahu Lanham, along with special guest producer in the background, Mr. James Martinez. And um, this is Off Planet Radio, Randy Moggins. It is Thursday, October 8th, 2020, 10.01 p.m. Online with Nahu Lanham. And James Martinez lurking in the background as he usually does, and <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so only the shadow knows. Yeah, he's the shadow. He he will show up at the most opportune moment. So we let that out of the bag. So you and I began a conversation the other evening, and it had to do with the spiral aspects of time and basing it off of off of your book spiral forecasting which i had read once a couple of years ago and just picked up the new edition of it and i'm in research for a book right now that i'm writing and a lot of the book is dealing with time in terms of what i call impactful events and as I'm going through writing, my intuition was telling me that time was not a line the way we've represented it in most of common fiction and even certain science papers, but that time actually is a spiral. It's a vertical, vortice energy field. So let's launch off of that. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, when you're talking about a vertical, it's not necessarily vertical per sure. se, but it is vortical. And, uh, ah, it, perfect. Uh, like vortical that. means uh, a circling uh, continuously toward the center, you know. So you've got two different kinds of lines going out, one going out and one coming back in. So you have a contractile and expansive process here one that uh, involves two different kinds of measurements in terms of space. Uh, The one that goes out, of course, is space itself, per se. And the one coming in, I call time, meaning, in other words, it comes to a central point at which events take place. So what constitutes an event? This is an interplay with, we quantify time on a dimensional scale as being the fourth dimension. 
Mm-hmm. So you, when you discuss time, you talk about time and space. And I believe the way we discussed this before, time and space are inverse ratios of each other. Right. Well, right. And uh, what you started out with before was very accurate because uh, on one level, you got Euclidean uh, geometry. Euclidean geometry, of course, is flat plane, two-dimensional. Yes. It, and you have a future moving on into a... I mean, a past moving into a, the future, a future moving backwards into the past. This is uh, a single plane, and uh, on a single plane, two lines never meet, okay? The only uh-huh. place that they actually meet yes. is uh, when you apply Riemannian uh, geometry, which is spherical. At that point, that's where the two lines can actually converge. On a sphere, they can converge, and at that point where what, the what geometry two, is that again? Now who? Riemannian. Riemannian. That's Riemann. Riemann. Bernard Riemann. Okay. This this is a person that Benkowski introduced to Einstein because uh, Einstein was looking for a, a geometry that could explain his concept of time space uh, of the continuum itself mm-hmm. as being. A unified uh, point mm-hmm. where the two converged into one thing. Okay, and that was all based in pretty much on block time, uh, the block concept of the universe, the idea that everything takes place at once. This this is evolved out of the idea of eternalism, that everything happens uh, simultaneously, right, like simultaneous. Right. Well, that's really spatial. That's a spatial concept. And the time itself is the point at which these uh, events actually take place. Uh, If you had two parallel lines, as you would have in Euclidean geometry, there would be no point in which these two... No intersection. No intersection, but they would converge. So the point at which information converges or uh, conjugates... And this is important when I say conjugates because it's a, we're talking about a wave where the wave intercepts in the hologram of the wholeness, where okay. the whole and the part, where the part and the whole come together to form one unified continuum. That's the part in which the information connects between uh, time and space to form the uh, actual point itself at which events emerge. You understand what I'm saying? So that's the point in which the continuum gives birth to the, to the now, the present. I mean, you got to realize that the present itself is an illusion. And no real present except that present at, at which that particular event emerges uh, for the moment. So it's a, only a momentary thing. has no... Uh, uh, existence outside of that uh, that momentary point in which those two lines cross to form that that unified field between time and space. So that's where Riemann uh, introduced the idea of, of spherical geometry. Min- Minkowski was trying to find a a math that would present the idea of general relativity t- to the masses. When you have an, a concept that basically say all points in time are equal, it's hard to demonstrate that in terms of geometry so the scientists could not comprehend it, this idea that he saw from an intuitive view. His is an intuitive concept, of course, you understand that. He he didn't yeah. actually operate from a mathematical uh, yeah, perspective. more like me. I can see th- I can see things. I have conceptualizations of things. I do not have the advanced math skills to represent them in equations. Mm-hmm. But what I'm understanding you saying here is that, relatively speaking, every moment is unique. Mm-hmm. Each each moment in the now is an act of we would say creation. In other words, we're interacting with both time and space. What is the operative? 
the operative is the point in which the two converge. In other words, when two, uh, two, for example, two, there's an agreement on a psychic plane for two. Ah, uh, okay. You see, and and, and okay. then you have a an emergence, and then that tells you something about the creation of the universe too. Because if you're looking back further enough to the Big Bang, you, you, there's a point in which information has to uh, emerge uh, into an actual thing. That point in which it emerged is the point in which it took on a, a linear linearity, uh, the point in which its uh, undifferentiated wholeness had to be broke down to a singular probability that could be expressed in terms of uh, the, a moment, uh, the the moment itself being the manifestation of life, for example, in the carbon molecule. Okay. So as little as I personally like the term Big Bang, because I think it folds into itself a whole lot of assumptions that we can't either quantify or actually directly experience except in the immediate now. So we'll, we'll take the Big Bang as one of these impact events, something that triggered into reality what we call universe. Yeah, let me say something about that though, okay. before you nope, dismiss please. it wholly. Okay. Uh, uh, I have uh, developed what I consider, and it's not a, probably not a new concept, I've seen it elsewhere, but it's evolved out of my own thinking on the subject, not that I'm, uh, I'm I know all things per se, but I'm just merely saying that from what I was able to gain, say, from my insights and studies of the nature of space, time, and the quantum field and uh, the manifestation of the so-called Big Bang and its relationship to all it is, I came to a realization that it had to also be a spiral principle. Well, when I say a spiral principle, I'm saying an oscillatory principle, one that one that expands. You see, that's your I'm happier with area. it already. I'm liking it, yes. You see what I mean? Yeah. It expands yeah. to the point and uh, to where it dissipates after a while. When it expands, it actually takes on more of a linearity. As it expands, it's, it takes on a linearity, and then, which means it does have a limited amount of uh, energy and entropy. Uh, so what happens is it has an entropic end. In which it's uh, kind of like a uh, think in terms of uh, a uh, Fourth of July uh, fireworks, you know, and when that mm -hmm. fireworks mm -hmm. goes out, all yeah. that all fireworks and uh, ash and everything comes back toward that center, collapses like a collapse or a black hole, back into the center. See what I mean? Mm -hmm. And as it collapses back into the center, it contracts to the point where it's uh, far beyond uh, the Planck length, 10 minus 32. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah. So it's, it, it shrinks back down. And you can imagine what this point is like, Randy. It's an incredibly small, minuscule point. Now, you can imagine all the e energy uh, that might have existed having collapsed back to a central yeah. point. Yeah. And as it collapsed back to the central point, that means an enormous amount of implosive power was uh, manifested at that central point. Well, that's the kind of the concept that goes into the atomic bomb, too. But by, by the way, but in what happens as it collapses back into the central point, it actually, uh, because of that compressive force, it reaches a, a point where it has to blow up again to 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 be released. So then it starts that oscillatory cycle over again, which is kind of a spiral pattern. See what I mean? You've got the uh, expansionary. Right. And then you have the contractile. As it's going out, it's actually coming back in. And, and here's the interesting thing about that. Now, think in terms of the speed of light, the amount of energy released in the electromagnetic uh, uh, or electro uh, photoelectric, I'm sorry, uh, effect in which light is released as there's shifts go on deep within the heart of the atom itself. As this energy is released, as this, uh, it's, it's, it's being 
propelled outward in terms of linear time outward. And as it does, it, it all these events are taking place at a hyper uh, dimensional speed, you know, a hyper warp speed, a speed so fast that when we look at uh, our, our relationship to where we're at in terms of where uh, the universe uh, was and where it's going, we're actually looking back through time. And that's mm -hmm. exactly, it mm -hmm. fits the whole concept of, of contemporary physics that we're looking back through time, you know, back to the point in which that first Big Bang took place. What we're doing is we're, we're looking uh, back from our point of perspective. Our point of perspective is the point in which time and space that that uh, continuum comes together to f to form that now point, well, where we're talking, for example, right now, we have agreed that this universe exists, and then what we're talking about right now is important for us, and uh, so we're getting a look. What we're doing is who we are and what we are right now is already taking place eons ago. So, uh, and against the odds of having to deal with knackered software coders and, and greedy corporations that screw the software constantly, I'll just throw that in and say Skype can hear it. There you go. <laughs> but we did battle through some technical issues to get this far. And I, where I, so where we take this is we're quantifying the quantifying it yes we're quantifying the causality but what i'm looking for i know that you're a student of the dow and yes. we share that um the ten thousand things rising and falling in relationship to subject object so we we we've quantified the causative aspects what we where i want to take this somewhat and this is really hard to express but i'll just i'll put it this way we ourselves perceptually whatever mechanics are going on in the background perceive events in quote real time unquote meaning our perceptual reality is based on a moment-by-moment-by-moment -moment -by -moment basis. Within the dynamic of the physics, the quantification, and the interaction of what we'll call human consciousness, there are events that occur as a result of the interaction of human consciousness. Is that a fair summation? Oh, that's that's partially correct. Uh, uh, I'm not sure that humans have the, uh, all that to do with it. We, there's so many other uh, factors feeding into the hologram of wholeness, you know, uh, many different dimensions, many different uh, sure. parallel universes, many mm -hmm. different kinds of lives that are uh, sharing in this uh, synergy that makes it all come about. So uh, we can we can interact with it. We can uh, give it some direction and focus, but it, the relevance of that focus is all related to where we see ourselves and I perceive ourselves in relationship to that wholeness. So we we do have control over it. Yet at the same time, uh, there's a question of whether we're really controlling anything or it's controlling us. Hmm. You see, because there's so much more going on than just us. But, but to, to simplify, let's say that we do have control over it uh, in terms of uh, Jane Roberts' set, okay? You right, create, okay, now we're on common ground, and yes. Okay. okay, so you create your own reality, that you have the ability to change it and uh, rearrange it and make it something that you want to make out of it. You can do that because you are connected to that uh, infinite amount of energy that goes into that creation. You're not limited from it, but you have to be more consciously, I think, you're going to be doing it on a, on a so-called unconscious, subconscious level, whichever you choose. But in, uh, if you want to get more in touch with it, then you want to try to unify with that collective unconscious. Mm -hmm. 
by collecting, uh, connecting with the collective unconscious, you have a lot more energy available to you to make things manifest in a much more uh, expedient way. So that's that's one of the things I focus on in my new book is the concept of of, of how to to create that exponential curve that allows you to to make things happen much faster for you. It's like a curve, you know, learning on a curve. Yeah, yeah. You know, if you learn on a curve, you what are you doing? You're just uh, you're you're basically getting at the information in a much quicker way by um, eliminating a lot of the external factors through and uh, focusing more on the more specific details of the yeah of the yeah. thing. That's so kind of what, the way I roll. So uh, what what we're doing here is we're we're striving to to get down to the central nexus of the thing, connect with the with the continuum, the 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 unified whole, the hologram itself that we're all part of. In uh, if you've read uh, Holographic Universe by Talbert, for yeah, example, yeah. he really gets into that. I'm I believe that we live in a holiverse. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so, yeah. I, I don't even call it a universe. It's too simplistic. A holiverse is uh, more like what I see is that we're all different parts of each other and, and everybody else is parts of us. Yeah. And that includes all these other extra dimensional spaces and times, by the way, that are out there. They're all, we're all accessible and they're, we're constantly in contact with them, even though our selective consciousness out here in this linearity called uh, uh, reality, <laughs> our, yeah. our limited version of what yeah. reality well, is. It's a restrictive reality in the sense yes. that… Yeah, it's the box. Yeah. <clears throat> it's the maze that we're working through at the time. So, but uh, if you yeah. if you go to a hyperdimensional level with that box, so you can see it from the outside, you can see into it uh, in the same way that they did in flat play, in the, in that flat play uh, movie, you know. Yeah. Flatland. Yeah. Flatland. That's that's an excellent. I use that as a meditational tool. I think it's excellent for people to to uh, start to learn and to think in terms of uh, planes, and also. Uh, polygons something else that I study quite a bit too is uh, polygonal consciousness expanding your consciousness um, I studied a lot of Plato's ideas and other other ways of getting at it but basically what I'm doing is I'm stretching space and time and extending myself beyond the, the limitations of, of the box in which I'm moving through and I'm, I'm striving to get at it from a from a hyperdimensional way. If we move into that continuum thinking, we all automatically uh, activate or catalyze aspects of ourselves which are connected to the archetypal whole that we're all uh, unified with. In the book Spiral Forecasting, one of the things that you talk about, and let me just, you discuss for instance the emotional energy and what emotions are and how we use that to activate and, and I'm paraphrasing because I'm not reading right now but basically the emotional energy that's required to perceive conceive or to predictively operate in a in a future mode in other words perhaps instead of saying creation we're anticipating ahead what you said ahead of the curve mm -hmm. but the emotional component is to us anyway uniquely human it is an act of an expression of consciousness and it and it's sort of somewhat uniquely human in our limited experience i mean animals appear to have some limited forms of emotions but when we're talking about the human we're talking about the creative aspects or the destructive aspects of emotions can you kind of bring that into the concept so far 
Right. Well, uh, consciousness, and I'm speaking in in uh, terms of that. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Antonio Damasio, for example. Um, he did some really insightful research into the nature of emotions. One thing he said, I liked how he phrased it, that the emotions is like the concrete that, that brings the, the picture together into a, a, a whole picture. You know, it's the glue that holds the, the, the stuff together that forms that collective uh, manifestation we call reality because the emotions uh, are the gravity and they can be uh, and, and, and to, to answer your question there more clearly they, are, they can also be the levity <laughs> which is okay. very interesting yeah, yeah. the gravity levity are two different aspects of one thing gravity is, is actually nothing but levity um, turned around and vice versa, you know, that's inversely proportional. The, the two are really one single entity, depending on how you're approaching them. And the point uh, that really makes a difference there is, is your point of perspective, how you're, how you're approaching the, uh, your reality. If you're, how you're approaching your reality, um, for example, emotionally is, is you're constructing out of this glue of these em, of these emotions mm -hmm. a, um, the things that are going to form not only your memories and the, the memories that are going to be the ones that are, uh, are going to hold your reality together and make it meaningful in the, in the long run, so to speak. It's going to be the things that that uh, makes it manifest, and uh, this this can be done either. One of the things I found out is that uh, if you focus uh, through negative emotions, you can create uh, the same kind of reality that you create if you focus through positive emotions. They both have the same power to create. Regardless uh, whether they might be uh, op so-called opposites, the two of them are, are the reason why they do is they have the same energy. Uh, um, so we're talking the, polarity here. We're talking the polarity of okay. it, right, right? Is equal in both directions. So if people put uh, a lot of motion into for example I, I I think for example if you want to levitate and you want to lift the, um, if you want to lift uh, people's spirits and lift the world and change the world in a positive direction think joy for example it automatically is it lifts yet in other words it reverses the tendency of things to come together uh, and um, be pulled down toward the center it, it reverses the, the direction it's, it's uh, redirects the energy in an upward way so you know that's the reason why a smile for example is so important you know, there's a, a lot of Buddhist focus on smiling yeah. If you smile internally and have that within your mindset, then you're automatically lifting yourself. You're using gravity in a, in a, in a, in a reverse directional way. You're using it in a levit levitating way. You're lifting yourself. So you have power over the way that uh, your reality manifests and how it comes together. You can bring it together you can you can uh, make it manifest in any particular way you want. The thing that um, I think that you're moving toward, though, is you, you want to understand how uh, emotions make things manifest, how they they come about, how they are drawn into uh, manifestation. For example, I, in the book, uh, I write about. Uh, there's a guy who plays uh, a guitar in, in his underwear in, in, on 42nd Street, you know, uh -huh. uh, the naked cowboy, they called him, you know. I remember this, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and the, the reason why they have him there and why he's uh, so important, and he actually makes a lot of money doing that, and it would seem like a very simple thing. But what he's doing, he's drawing attention emotionally. 
Mm-hmm. There's a whole lot of things going on within people when they look at somebody, some odd character like that standing on the side of the street in his underwear playing a guitar. They're thinking, what in the world? And as they do, they're drawing all that attention into that area. And right away, you can automatically put signs behind him. You see, and people can be drawn to that on an unconscious level. They actually would be uh, responding to the emotional content of the singing cowboy when, in fact, they're also drawn to the advertising beyond. So the emotions act like a, a gravitational field in drawing your attention in whether a positive or negative way to a central figure or central point and that the the information that's coming in from uh, another level is actually affecting you uh, in a very strong way. So it's used as a central drawing force. That's where we're going to leave it for this segment, segment one of the interview with Nahu Lanham and the concepts behind uh, spiral time and building into some of the, shall we say, physiological, psychological, psychic, scientific, and mathematic concepts that we're delving into in this series. Uh, The second segment of this is available to subscribers on the Patreon site. That's patreon.com forward slash Randy Moggins. It goes deeper into the subjects, as does the entire Eye of the Needle series. This series is designed to predictively prepare us for the near future and to point consciousness towards the convergence points that we believe are coming. All of this is very timely, and we hope that you might want to partake of the information as it emerges. You can do that again at patreon.com forward slash Randy Moggins. The truth is out there. It truly is inside of you. Use the spiral. This is Off Planet Radio. You are listening to Off Planet Radio at offplanetradio.com.